in for Lele Bochile this afternoon, and we are talking about SMEs. We're going to be talking the masterclass on bridging the SME funding gap. It's a critical issue for entrepreneurs and small business owners because access to finance remains one of the biggest hurdles for SMEs worldwide, often limiting their ability to grow, to innovate and create jobs. And boy, do we need jobs. In this session, we're going to dive into practical strategies for overcoming these barriers from alternative financing options and government grants to tips for improving credit readiness and building investor relationships. So whether you are a business owner, investor or financial professional, this masterclass will equip you with the knowledge and tools needed to help SMEs reach their full potential by closing that funding gap. And we're talking about this because South Africa has one of the highest failure rates of new SMEs in the world at an estimated 70 So I'm just wondering, are you in the SME sector? I mean, how does it work for you? Have you experienced a funding problem or a solution? This is your own small business and every penny counts. Payments, we know uh, it's a problem. If the government owes you money, it's a problem. Everyone seems to delay. And maybe it's because it's a size issue. They think they can just bully you, but uh, it's unacceptable. So... I want to I, I want to hear from you. I mean, are you in this sector? Have you started your own business? Uh, do you have a funding problem? If you've overcome that funding problem, how did you do that? You can call us on 011-883-0702. You can tweet me at Radio 702 using the hashtag 702 Afternoons. You can WhatsApp me on 072-702-1702. You can also SMS me on 31702. 702. Masterclass. So we've got this masterclass for a good hour. So we've got a guest who is open to taking your questions. It's somebody who's got a lot of experience. Um, Catherine Weinberg is with Fatella, the biggest female accelerator in Africa. She's the founder and group CEO of Fetola, a multifaceted business that nurtures the growth and sustainability of organizations and entrepreneurs in Africa. Very good afternoon to you. Yes, good afternoon to you, Jane. And I'm lucky I'm not stuck in the traffic, but hopefully we can <laughs> um, keep keep those poor drivers entertained and informed uh, with, our, with, our, with our content. Oh, because I'm sure many of them are thinking, where am I going to get the money from? Who's going to pay me? How's it going to work? I should imagine in your, your line of work, you must see some exciting stuff. Uh, yes, of course. Uh, entrepreneurship is always an exciting space to be in. I think that people, uh, people jump into becoming entrepreneurs because they love the cut and thrust. They like to uh, be in the center of finding solutions. And uh, and one of those is, of course, finding the money in order to grow your business. But it's always an exciting, exciting space here in Fratello. Mm. Uh, so tell us what you see. I mean, I know you've worked with or have graduated more than 2,000 emerging SMEs. So what is it other than the funding? I mean, obviously, that's that's key, right? It's one of the most crucial elements to making it a success. Uh, I think let's back up a minute uh, just so that people can really contextualize um, who we are and where we're coming from. Okay. Um, so I've, I'm an entrepreneur myself of uh, many, um, many years. Mm-hmm. I've uh, started and grown businesses in three different countries and in, in many different sectors. So I, I kind of come from an entrepreneur's background, understanding exactly what it is that uh, that we need to survive. Mm-hmm. And for Tupper uh, is uh, uh, really is here to help people to start, grow and scale their businesses. Okay. And and we do that in three ways. So we, we help people through acceleration and acceleration is essentially taking helping somebody uh, to start the business right, to set up their systems and processes right. Uh, maybe the accelerator gives them uh, mentorship, wraparound mentorship, access to finance, access to markets. So usually acceleration, uh, we take people uh, on a journey, usually in a cohort of anything, uh, 6, 12 or 18 months, depending on, on the sector. And then we, so we've been doing that for nearly 18 years. So we really have got some well-tested models there. We're very proud of the, uh, of the results that, uh, that we achieved there. 
And in fact, 87% of the businesses that exit or graduate from our um, accelerators are still in business 10 years later. And I don't know if you know the stats, but that's like nine times the national average. And so what we really say is that it's really important not just to create businesses that are there for six months or for a year, but really to help people to build businesses um, that can be anchors in the economy. So that's what that's kind of the core of what we've done for so many years. And then what we realized is um, not only in South Africa, but right across the pan, pan African continent, mm. is there's this huge challenge where there, there are so many so many businesses with potential, but they're not able to access finance. And what we realize is that um, that's both a, you know, that's a problem of investment readiness. And so our, the second component of what we do is we pri provide investment readiness solutions for entrepreneurs. And then the third leg of what we do is give them access to affordable finance. And so maybe, yeah, so it's acceleration, investment readiness, and access to affordable finance. Um, and we, yeah, we work right across the, across the country in those, in those three areas. So I, I don't know if that kind of maybe it puts a little bit more of a uh, context as to who I am and, and, uh, yeah, and, and the background to, to the conversation. No, no that's very important. And, uh, it's good to know that I'm really talking to somebody who really knows uh, what's going on because you've been there, you've seen what works, uh, you've helped nurture people. How do you identify those who should go through your program, who you feel you could help? What is it that you look for? So, yeah, thanks for that. And I just need to say, I've got some crib notes here. I have sitting next to me um, one of my uh, young investment uh, analysts, uh, Sebasang okay. um, uh, Lekuleng. Um, and I'm just, because I, I, I just thought, let me make sure that I've really got the person who's on the ground and dealing when we get to the nitty gritty of the real finance stuff. I've got this expert next to me. So, so if you have hear a different voice, it's Sebastian. Okay. Um, and, yeah, and sorry, that's actually thinking. such a smart thing to do, isn't it? Identify your your not necessarily your weaknesses, but know what you're not strongest at, and completely, get somebody else to do completely, it. Completely, Jane, and that, that's you know that's why we get good people in a team because we all need to know where our strengths and weaknesses lie, and mm. and he's definitely the strong man on what's knowing what what's going. In, uh, in helping businesses with the nitty gritty, the practicalities of accessing finance. So when we get to that, I've got, I've got my sidekick here that's much more knowledgeable than me. Smart. Um, to go back to your question, how do we, how do we find businesses? Mm -hmm. So, so the way that we, we, we have, we, the way that we work is we work with corporates, um, with local corporates, with philanthropic organizations like the SAB Foundation or the JP Morgan um, Philanthropy International. We work with international investors like the embassies, the EU, mm -hmm. um, and, and local corporates, for example, FNB, um, Nedbank, uh, in order to fund the accelerators that we implement. And so those clients would come to us and say, hey, look, we want to help 100 youth uh, to start and grow a successful business, or we want to help um, 300 small green businesses to access finance. And then what we do is we put together programs to, uh, specially designed for, for those clients, for that group, that target group that they're looking for. And then what we do is we go out usually with a public call. So if it's an accelerator, we would go out with a public call for candidates to apply. And in fact, we have one at the moment. Our youth startup accelerator is in fact in call right now. So we're looking for a hundred young, um, very early stage uh, young South Africans that okay. are wanting to prove, wanting to kind of get a very early stage business proved, proven and in growth in growth phase. So yeah, and and then what we do is we have it's very rigorous. So these programs are hugely valuable. They're they're um, they're really. Um, it, they're really gold uh, for people to be able to get onto a, a, a growth program. Mm -hmm. And so we go looking, especially for the entrepreneur, how, how committed is the entrepreneur? Do they really have the kind of the mental resilience? Uh, do they have the passion and purpose in order to, to not just to start a business, but really to take it uh, through into long-term success?
Gosh, this is really exciting, isn't it? I mean, talking of money, we're going to have to, uh, well, not have to, we uh, joyously listen to these adverts uh, that pay our bills. And then after that, we're going to talk more about uh, getting people onto your program, uh, SMEs, some of the challenges and finding much needed money. 702 Masterclass. And our masterclass today is on SMEs, how to get funding, how to make it a success. I mean, it's horrifying to hear how many SMEs fail within the first couple of months. And South Africa's got a very bad reputation on the continent, well, worldwide, of SMEs just collapsing early on. We know it's all about accessing those funds and uh, we want to find out what the current funding models are, how you can get that business up and running and how you really nurture being an entrepreneur. My guest today is Catherine Weinberg. And she is the founder and group CEO of Fatola. It's the biggest female accelerator in Africa, though we're not focusing just on females when it comes to SMEs. It's uh, the same for for everybody, I should imagine, accessing funds. And Sebo Singh is sitting beside Catherine, and Sebo Singh is going to talk us through the nitty gritty when it comes to finances. Uh, Catherine, you you focus on females and um, and helping them in the business. Is it harder for women? in this area? Oh, that's a tough question. Um, I think uh, this, the thing is that it's, it's tough to be an entrepreneur anyway. Mm. Uh, I think it is tougher to be a woman in this space. Yep. And uh, I think it's extremely difficult for women who come from very traditional backgrounds. Mm. So if in the daytime you're, you're there leading a team, uh, running a business, making big decisions, and at home you have to go back into a more traditional environment when um, you're expected to be quiet and in the kitchen. I think that causes huge challenges. And certainly with the uh, female entrepreneurs that we uh, that we support, uh, managing that kind of dichotomy is something, uh, yeah, that always seems to be cared for. Not but I also think women, I mean, sorry, Jane, our experience is that women do very well. Mm. Um, and in fact, in our in our major, one of our, uh, our major um, program, the SAB Foundation Tolwana program, over the last three years, I think a nine out of ten winners have been uh, have been female, and that's uh, that's on a you know on a pure performance basis. So women women do very well in business. Um, mm. We're really good at juggling lots of balls, and, and early stage business and business ownership is often about the ability to do that. Yeah, that we are. Okay, so uh, let's go back a little bit as well and talk about uh, the state of SMEs, uh, particularly in South Africa, and what is it that that we are doing wrong? Why are so many collapsing so early on? What's missing? So, Jane, I think the first thing is that, um, you know, in South Africa, our economy is not growing fast enough. No. So we often talk about um, unemployment as the problem. I think it's important to understand that unemployment is a symptom of the problem. And the real problem is that we don't have economic growth. So from the top end, we don't have enough investment into the bus- into the economy. Um, and that's not stimulating um, a sufficient growth. And small businesses can only feed off what you know what's happening at a, at a greater level. So yes, you can create your own uh, markets, but for businesses to thrive, you need to have a really thriving economy. So it's pretty tough for any small business um, in a in an economy that's stretched. Um, I think that's the first that's the first problem that we're dealing with. Mm. The second problem we're dealing with is that we have this very poor education um, environment in South Africa. And I think that the figures are quite horrendous. It's something like 5% of uh, matriculants pass maths with more than 60% um, a pass rate. And so that means that you get people coming in to the workspace and into the entrepreneurial space that can't understand basic information like percentages and ratios, which are really fundamental yeah. to being able to manage your finances. Um, and then, so I think that's the second component. Then the third component is that what we found is that the ideal person coming to be an entrepreneur, somebody who is has both work experience, is educated, mm-hmm. and has work experience, and then chooses to become an entrepreneur. So if you have this, you have a kind of backup of challenges that people are not being properly educated, they're really struggling to have the basic work uh, experience. Um, and then, um, you know, and, and then, and then they have those challenges coming into becoming entrepreneurs. So I think these things all 
affect um, the, the difficulties that we have in, in building a thriving uh, entrepreneurship sector. Mm. I mean, just yesterday we heard about jobless numbers. I mean, more people are in jobs this quarter than the previous quarter, but I mean, still, you know, shocking. The jobless rate fell to 32.1% in the third quarter. Unemployment rate fell to 32.1%. I mean, that's down from a two-year high of 33.5%. I mean, it marks the first decrease, but I mean, we still have a staggering number of people who are out of work. Um, do you think, I mean, obviously SMEs can help when it comes to unemployment. Um, how do people who are unemployed get into this? I mean, what should, what should they be looking for? So I think the starting point is the, is, um, to, to hustle. So uh, I think that's one thing that's so exciting to see the um, a lot of talk around township economies and informal economies. I'm yes. a real in favor of that. Mm. Um, I think that people, you just, and there's lots of people doing basic entrepreneurship training out there. So if there's a young person out there that uh, is struggling to find a job and really wants to um, find another way to be self-sufficient, mm-hmm. uh, I think the thing is to go looking out for some basic entrepreneurship training and then just start to hustle, you know, if that can just be simple things like um, using your skills. So maybe I'm good at baking. I make really good fat cook. Mm. Um, it's saying, okay, how could, could I start a business like that? And just even selling first of all to relatives, maybe in the church, local church, and then slowly growing the business uh, through local markets and then building up from there. You know, that's something that's available um, to, to virtually every, anybody. And, uh, and in fact, 99% of businesses that start start with little or no money. And so, um, yeah, it is possible. And many people do that is just to start from seeing a need, meeting the need and then growing um, organically. Tell us about the current funding models. What do we have access to? Okay, great. I'm going to actually let uh, Seba Sang handle that. Mm. I think that, uh, yeah, to you if you just want to give an outline. Thanks. All right. Thank you, Catherine, for bringing me into the conversation and good afternoon, Jane. Good afternoon. So we, we have a couple of funding models, mm-hmm. particularly in um, extending affordable debt financing solutions to SMEs. What we have realized is that, you know, the traditional banking models and the financing models don't really take into account the risks that are associated with early growth stage businesses. And as a result, they tend to reject uh, businesses. I mean, we've often heard it being said from SMEs that they're unable to access financing from from banks. Mm. Um, And so there's a misconception that there isn't enough financing around for SMEs within South Africa. And that couldn't be further from the truth. The, The reality is there's a plethora of financing. However, there aren't enough uh, opportunities, bankable in, uh, opportunities for, for, for it to find, for the money to find the home. So on one side, you have investors who are crying out for investable opportunities. And on the other side, you have SMEs who are saying, um, where are the opportunities? So there've been, there's been a, a market that's, that's, that's been created, um, uh, especially for non-banking financial institutions, um, offering debt and equity. And that's that's a space that we have entered into. So we have the Fotola SME Fund, which is particularly looking at financing businesses that are within the green and circular economy. We are focusing on those businesses because what we have realized from the performances in our accelerated programs is that green and circular economy businesses can really uh, grow and scale. They can achieve uh, profit margins because they are adapting to making sure that their 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 waste is utilized, it's repurposed, and create can create um, additional uh, business streams and business models. Mm-hmm. The other reason that we have decided to focus on supporting green and circular businesses is because there hasn't been enough financing or support for that specific uh, model of businesses. And that's because that um, the the assets that they need are typically novel, or the business models are typically novel. So um, investors might see that that uh, and associate that with risks. 
Okay, Sebo Singh, um, you are the man that oversees uh, the um, the figures, the mathematics and everything that is needed to get a, a business up and running. So I'm talking to you and Catherine from the company Fetola. We're talking about SMEs, how to unlock funding, what it is that you need to do to make your business a success. And remember... You can always call us and put your questions to these two. I mean, they, they know their stuff. They can maybe help you get over the line. But uh, we've got the news headlines. 702. Masterclass. We're talking about bridging the SME funding gap. We're just talking about all things SME and how you can make a success of it. So I have got two guests, one talking about the financial side of things, that's Sebo Singh, and Catherine giving us, uh, painting us the, the bigger picture of what it is that we need to turn around South Africa's reputation of uh, being an SMA failure. Uh, Unati's been hanging on the line uh, for some time from Centurion, and Unati, I believe you want to uh, pick the guests, or you want to take on the guests, uh, take on... Uh, Reason for the high entrepreneurship failures. Go ahead. Good afternoon. Anati, can you hear me? All right, we seem to have lost Anati there for a moment. Um, Catherine. Plaiki Masejo says, as the Unemployed People's Party, I appreciate your topic. It starts with small businesses to create jobs, right? Yeah. Great. Um, yeah, thanks. Uh, thanks, Shane. I think there's, so let's just, I want to quickly touch on that. It's really, yes, there's huge potential for small businesses to create jobs. It's also a business's imperative to first be profitable. I think it's a really dangerous assumption when people, uh, you know, believe that they can start a business to create jobs. You first of all need a business that is financially viable. Um, so, so we always talk about the three, the three prerogatives here. First of all, it must be financially viable, it must be growing, it must be profitable, so your revenue model uh, must work. Then secondly, um, yes, where you can, it's wonderful to be able to create jobs, so become what we would call people friendly. Mm -hmm. And then we're really passionate, especially now with the world kind of collapsing around us and climate change being really right in our face, it's about saying how do we then also create businesses that are planet um, that are planet positive. So I think yes, job creation is important, but number one, you have to be profitable mm. uh, in order to be able to support those jobs. All right, let's go to Anati now. He's on the line. Uh, Anati, sorry that we lost you a little bit earlier on. Go ahead with your question. Yeah, thank you very much for the opportunity. Hope hopefully I'm audible. Um, mine basically is purely looking at uh, the failure. Because if I look at the failure of the SMMEs in South Africa, it's not so much driven by their inability to sell, but it's because of the concentration of franchising in this country. You go into one mall, you've seen all the malls in South Africa, and it's the same businesses. And now, I mean, if, if, if we continue to build franchises, the logistics behind it and everything else, what are the chances that we can compete with Woolworths? What are the chances that you can compete with SPA? Because each and every product, in fact, any person that sells to them, it becomes a price taker because they've actually uh, uh, captured the customers in South Africa. If you were to, in fact, most countries where, 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 in fact, if you leave South Africa, go to Europe, you go to America, you don't see what you see in South Africa. It is very unique to this country where you see franchises left, right, and center. In most countries, the small businesses that are actually are actually driving the economy and the sustainability. It's small, people, uh, what do you call it, family businesses. And this used to be the, the, the case here in South Africa before 1990, 1994, where small township economy was driven by so-and-so's father and so-and-so's mother, the garages and all that. And that disappeared after 1994. And this is exactly why we are where we are. That is just my view. Thank you. Okay, let's, uh, let's hear what Catherine has to say about that. Thanks for that, Donati. Thanks so much, Vinati. I, I, I really agree with you. I think that we do have a challenge uh, with malls moving into um, into traditional areas. Uh, in fact, I was just speaking to Professor uh, Bernang Mukhali just the other day, and he was also really irate about that. Mm. Uh, the challenge is that when you move a mall into a into a, um, a township or into any uh, suburb, 
you uh, you displace the small businesses that are already there. So I think that you've you've definitely identified something that's a concern. There are um, there are organisations that are really doing good work uh, to address this, and one of them would be the Waterfront um, here in South Africa in uh, Cape Town, uh, managed by Growth Point Properties. They've really understood that in order to to create a thriving um, mall, you need a thriving ecosystem, and that means that you need really good uh, market ready professional small businesses in that kind of um, in in that mall ecosystem. And so I'm a real uh, proponent of encouraging that. So you've definitely uh, hit the nail on the head there. And hopefully, um, hopefully we'll get more we'll get more more owners that that are that are mindful of that and do support this really good, this really good thriving ecosystem of small businesses uh, alongside the, the the main brands. Okay, uh, we were talking about credit and the current funding models. And Seb was saying yeah. you were you were highlighting um, how much there is actually to access out there. Um, if you don't have a credit rating, that uh, puts you far away from the banks, right? That is that is correct. So what is often used to assess um, somebody's credit worthiness is you know, their credit report. So if they don't necessarily have a track record, it might be difficult to do so. However, there are new ways or alternative ways of measuring someone's behavior as it relates to paying their bills on time. Mm. So for instance, if there's not necessarily a credit history, we can look at your lease payments for the business premise. Mm. Are you paying that um, regularly on time without a problem? We might even delve into your behavior with money as to what you spend it on. For instance, if you are mixing your personal and your business finances all in one, and we see, you know, monies that are misallocated to uh, gambling, for instance, mm. that would tell us that you are a risky um, business owner to lend to. So there are fundamental building blocks on the road to being financing ready. Okay. And I, I suppose some of the, the no-nos, I mean, unless it works for you, uh, borrowing money from family and friends. So, Jane, I want to jump in here and maybe add, uh, take one little bit step backwards. I think it's just really important that entrepreneurs understand that they need to get the basics right. Okay. Um, and the first basic is they need to be recording their finances. How many entrepreneurs can be in businesses three and four uh, years old that don't have a basic set of uh, financial accounts. And uh, and so the first thing is that entrepreneurs need to get the basics right. Doesn't matter if you're just starting up as a little hustle side, side um, you know, side hustle. Mm -hmm. Make sure that you're recording your finances every month because that gives you, that's your passport to access finance. The second thing is to learn how to manage your money. And so um, Seba Sang was just referring to things like you know, don't don't put gambling expenses through your business account, separate your business account, you know, don't overextend yourself on credit. Mm. Um, and then the third thing is if you're wanting to grow a business and access growth finance, it's then about understanding, you know, where do I, how do I become investment ready? And the big gap you know, that we've been talking about is that there's lots of money wanting to be lent into the sector. There's lots of entrepreneurs that want to access that money, but they don't know how to translate their value and show it to the investor so that the investor says, yes, this is a good investment. I'm going to lend money. Or I'm going to um, I'm going to grant money into that business. So it's just maybe important just to say, actually, guys, there's a certain things that are just fundamentals you've got to get in place before you become technical, um, you know, about actually accessing the money. Mm. And that's smart, isn't it? It shows that uh, you're thinking ahead, you've got nothing to hide. Uh, look at my financials. I mean, even if they're minimum, minimal, um, that, yeah. that uh, it's, it's all there. It's opaque. You know, you know, Jane, what we found is that um, it seems to be a fundamental, right? We think it's an obvious, mm. um, but in reality, I would think nine out of 10 entrepreneurs don't get that right. Uh, so you, most people become entrepreneurs because they love the hustle and they like the selling. They like doing what they do and their finances are, are something that they avoid. Mm. Um, and so it's, even though we know we should be doing it, uh, there are certain emotional barriers and technical knowledge barriers that prevent, uh, prevent us from doing that. And, and it's really important to recognize those and fix those. Mm.
So how do you fund that gap? Say you've got a, a funding gap while you're waiting for some money. Uh, I mean, what should, what should you, what could you be doing in that time? So, so there, there are really, so there are kind of four, there are four, maybe five uh, um, opportunities to access finance. Mm. The first thing is in any business, you should be managing the money that you've got better. Yeah. And that means plugging the holes, not paying, uh, you know, not giving people credit uh, where they, where you can't afford it and maybe um, negotiating longer payment terms with your suppliers. So managing your money internally, that's the cheapest form of uh, access to finance. Okay. The next level is grant finance. And it, especially if you're a black owned business in South Africa, there is a lot of opportunity to access grant finance. Mm -hmm. The challenge there is that you almost well, in fact, all of those grant opportunities require the business to be registered, registered and up, paid up with tax with their SARS, um, that all their employees have contracts, they're South African, et cetera. So a lot of compliancy often yeah. prevents people from accessing that free money. Um, the next level is would be really purchase order finance. So there's a lot of opportunity for people that have got an order, maybe got an order with a, with a corporate or a large organization it's possible to get access to what they call purchase order finance. Mm -hmm. um, that tends to be uh, much more freely available. That is quite expensive. And the next level would be debt or loan finance, and that's traditionally the banks. Um, I think the figures there is that only 14 out of every 100 applications uh, for finance actually go through. So there's, again, there's challenges where entrepreneurs yeah. are not ready or they don't know how to present themselves. Mm -hmm. um, and then the, then the last category would be equity. So a business that has really got massive growth potential, um, there's opportunity to access e equity. So just important to understand, uh, you know, for entrepreneurs to understand is this kind of journey, this ladder, if you like, of different mm. uh, different types of finance to access. Okay, uh, we're going to be taking a spot break now, and then we're going to be talking about competition in the SME field and how you have these negotiations so that you don't get bargained down and uh, uh, what it is that you should do so that you are... Um, constantly making money and feeling secure. Cohen, we're going to come to you, but uh, just give us a couple of minutes. Let's listen to these spots. 702 Masterclass. Okay, we are talking about SMEs, Catherine, with Catherine Weinberg from Fertola, the clever lady who started that, and also a senior investment analyst is doing the number crunching for us, Sebosang Lekuleni. And Cohen, you have been holding on for a while. Cohen is calling us from Santon, and he sells bicycles for 4,000 rands, and I'm going to pass you over, and you can ask the question that you want to do. I should imagine about the, the competitive side of things. Go ahead. Yes, Hi guys, um, I sell I sell low rider bicycles, so I sell it online. So I, I want to try to get into big stores, but the problem is like the big stores they want a, a big percentage, like fifty percent of of like four thousand. They want it to want me give it to a two thousand rand, so that they can sell for four thousand rand. So how am I making money? I, you, I can't be compared to big bicycle companies. You know, I'm a small business, so how do I go about that way? Thanks for that, Cohen. Catherine? Um, yeah, thanks for that. I mean, pricing is really an issue, and I think small businesses often struggle uh, to be competitive. What I can only say to you, Cohen, is that it's important that you create a niche market. So it sounds as though if you're going to try and go head-to-head -head and sell online against, business, uh, against um, others that are cheaper than you, you're in a little bit of a, a difficult spot. I would rather say back off and say, how do I create a niche? You know, can I become a niche uh, bike seller to a particular audience uh, that is prepared to pay the prices that uh, that I want? So, uh, always the re re suggestion to small businesses is create a niche that you can own, um, and then it becomes less about price and more about the service and the quality that you're that you're providing. Does that answer your yeah. question, Cohen? Yes, yes, in a way, but you know, like. My product needs to be in big stores so that people can actually see and touch it because when you're online, they're just seeing a picture. Like the kids that walk around in the stores, they need to, they're the ones that actually need to get the attraction because the people that's online is mostly the parents. Yeah. You know, at yeah. the end of the day, this becomes, this is really about market, uh, market readiness. So the reality is that um, we need to be competitive in the market. So just to stand on the side of the retailer, uh, or the big organization that you're trying to sell through, there's a price point that they need to meet, right? 
So they, the customers will only pay a certain price. Uh, they, if they go beyond that, they're not going to win and you're not going to win because they're not going to sell anything. And so it is the responsibility of the retailer to make sure that they're pricing right. Um, but having said that, um, it also needs to be fair for you. So I think if you have a product that is really unique um, and competitive, you will be in a position to negotiate. But if your if your product, if your bicycles are just like any other bicycle, um, and other people can supply it uh, cheaper than you, then you're going to you're going to struggle. Uh, again, my suggestion there is that rather than trying to go onto the onto the big stores, uh, which often is not the way to make the best profit, um, is to say let's uh, let's stay away from there. Let me continue to sell um, to my niche market where I can charge a higher price. Okay, I understand. Thank. Thanks for that, Cohen. I really appreciate you calling in. Uh, how how hard is it to grow your business? I mean, what should you be thinking from a funding point of view if you want to? Because it, it really is that that challenge, isn't it? Should I hire more people? Should I get bigger, or should I stay yeah. the same? So, so there's we often get excited by growth, right? People mm. put these big growth targets, and they say, "I want to double ten x," or "I want to you know get into Woolworths." And often the reality is that as you expand, um, your problems expand, your margins reduce, and then you become all about efficiency. Mm. Um, and so it depends. I always say there's two types of entrepreneur. There's the entrepreneur that just wants, that loves the game. They love the hustle. They like, you know, they, they like the day to day thrill of entrepreneurship. And they probably just want to stay small, but they call mom and pop stores really, really important, a vital component of the, of our ecosystem. There are a few. And maybe it's one in um, it's one in ten of those entrepreneurs that really have the appetite to build a bigger business. And then that needs a different type of personality. That needs somebody that can ma- that can manage um, a system that can uh, recruit and delegate. And then you have a whole different you open a different world of of scale. And it's not for everybody. Um, and then when you do scale, yes, of course, it's absolutely essential that you can access finance. Uh, which is at which point you realize, oh my word. If only I'd record my finances better from the beginning. Mm. So that's usually when people work out that they did it wrong. And the role of sustainability in all of this and the cost implications there? You know, Jane, uh, we've just completed a really exciting uh, circular economy accelerator um, with our with, with partners, Nedbank, uh, JP Morgan and the Embassy of Finland. And the results have completely blown us away. So if anybody's keen to learn more, please go onto our website and download our report. But effectively, what we found is that by teaching businesses about circular economy methods, so for circular economy methods for small business, Mm -hmm. they were able to double their growth rate compared to businesses that did not have that knowledge. They increased their profitability by 70 percent. They added jobs at more than four jobs per business, and then they became more planet friendly. And so I think that what we're proving here is sustainability is no longer a nice to have. It's really central to building a business that's profitable, people-friendly, and planet-positive. Mm. Okay, so sustainability, uh, that there are many avenues in which to access funds if you know where to look. And I should imagine that a lot of listeners would like to get in touch with you and find yeah. out more and pick your brains. How do they go about that? So thanks, Jane. I mean, access to green finance is quite tricky. Um, it is difficult. Mm-hmm. Uh, we do have solutions for that. Um, if people want to be matched to funds, they want to find out where do I go for my finance, they should go onto our website, lulu.com. Uh, that's H-L-O-L-O.com. And if they want to get general information uh, from us about um, uh, green accelerators, either to support a green accelerator, to, to if you're a corporate wanting to green up your supply chain, wanting to improve your ESG score, uh, contact us at info at fotola.coza or again go onto the website fotola.coza uh, to have a look there's lots of resources there for entrepreneurs for investors um, and there's also access to our our two green funds there the nedbank green growth uh, grant fund and our sme fund that uh, seba Singh mentioned earlier yes and thank you to seba Singh lekuleni and you talking there catherine weinberg found-